Coming up on Theatre Talk, Oliver, have sure. you met the, any royals? Yeah, well, when William found out that I was going to play him, he invited me to Highgrove for a, <laughs> oh, yeah. for a game of polo and a yeah. kebab. And we, <laughs> and we sat around and uh, we just sort of chewed the fat, as it were, and he just told me, look, just make sure when you play me, have more hair, um, be as awesome as you possibly can. It was, it was great. We had a great day. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. <laughs> From New York City, this is Theatre Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. Coming up, three actors from Charles III, but first we're going to talk about some other royals now starring in the drop-dead great production of Once Upon a Mattress. We have with us Jackie Hoffman, who's playing Princess Winifred. <laughs> <laughs> Her co-star, John Lipsinka Epperson, who's playing Queen <laughs> Agravina. A role and he was born to play. Absolutely. Sure. And Jason Sweet Tooth Williams yeah. playing Prince Dauntless. Welcome, all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Did you all uh, grow up knowing Once Upon a Mattress? I mean, it's a fun show, and I believe there was a TV version of it, if I'm not mistaken. I think there was an everything version of it. I'm the one person on the planet who has never appeared in any <laughs> version of this in school or camp. <laughs> Everyone else has. <laughs> Mary Rogers Show, one of the, I think, just about the only Broadway musical Mary Rogers. Which Rogers. made Carol Burnett a star yeah. and now is going to be, Jackie, you stop the show. You stop the show. show. You were wonderful. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> this is, she's been waiting all these years to be a star and this is it, Jackie. It. Now, John, wasn't this production your idea? Did You went to the Transport Group with this? Kind of. Um, I had been wanting to do this show again. I had been in it in college. Uh, <laughs> as Princess? As Queen Agravina? Uh, no, I was in the ensemble. I played uh. a character named Sir Studley, which is, of course, <laughs> a joke. <laughs> but, Susan, I hope you don't mind. I'm going to correct you. Her name is Agravain. Oh, of course. Yes. I'm missing the whole joke. Agravain. Yes. And Michael, just so you know, Mary did write another Broadway show that was not a success called yeah, what was Hot that? Spot. Hot Spot. With that's Judy right. Holliday. Oh, that's right. That's yeah. right. Who's directed this production now? Jack Cummings, who's the artistic director of Transport Group. Jack Cummings the <laughs> third. <laughs> yes. Jack, the third. <laughs> Jack Cummings the second, lousy. <laughs> the third, <Very> genius. <laughs> Can you make the case that this is a, a somewhat neglected classic American musical? Is this why you were attracted to it? Is it underappreciated? Well, one reason I was attracted to it is because there's a great part for me in it. Oh, God, typical <laughs> actor, right? <laughs> but I also wanted to see Jackie in this show and wanted to see Jackie do her first lead and wanted to work with Jackie again, which I had done with great pleasure in the past. And so I called her up and I said, have you ever thought about doing this show? And she was resistant at first, but I think she's Long having... Long in the tooth, I said. Yeah. Long in the tooth. But I think she's having a good time <laughs> yes. now, from what I can tell. Make it mine! <laughs> <laughs> you thought the show was long in the tooth? Old-fashioned? I... <laughs> I'm trying to be polite, That was Jackie. my first... Yeah, no, that's all right. <laughs> I do think the show is... I think it's undervalued, actually. You know, it's never listed in the that's a, a list of the... If you don't know him, that's a rave. <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, you do it in that. You feel it's it's a cannily put together little show. The score is gorgeous. gorgeous. And... As good as anything her father ever wrote. Really, uh, definitely. Absolutely. Beautiful, beautiful music. I knew Mary quite well, and she was one of the great dames. of yes. of, of the broad. Theater. Yeah, she was abroad. She was proud of being abroad, and I always wondered why she had never written much um, more than this and, and Hotspot, and uh, she just found it impossible being the daughter of. Richard Rogers well, to carry that. on in his... It was an career. identity problem, I think, that she wanted to forge her own identity and not be a composer. And so she got the gig writing Freaky Friday, and so she had this whole new identity as a book writer. Yeah, yeah. Did you know her? Well, I met her uh, right after we did the concert version a couple of years ago. Mm. And uh, she invited me to her apartment at the Beresford, and we had lunch, and she said, I want a full production. Really? And so that's what has led ah. to what we're doing now. Hmm. Did you know her at all, Jackie? I met her at the same time John did. I met her at, at the concert. 
loved me. I didn't get invited to her apartment, but I'm sure that was an oversight. <laughs> well, she did come. I did a show at 54 Below, and she schlepped herself and her then ill husband, Hank Gittel. Yeah, I knew him. And they came to 54 Below, and she just was beaming like a proud mom. I was in their apartment many, many times for cocktail parties and dinners. It was a really... You really hadn't made it in the theater until you got on the Mary Rogers. Salon, thing. yeah. 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 <laughs> yes, <laughs> That's a joke, Jackie. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I know I haven't made it in the theater. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on this show. <laughs> um, I want to just get background from all of you. Um, since you're accomplished actors, what, did you, what was the first thing you saw that made you fall in love with the theater that made you want to go into the theater? Uh, well, uh, the very first Broadway show I ever saw, was, which was really important to me, was um, The Who's Tommy? which I saw with my grandparents. I was here in New York, I'm from Connecticut, and I was here for an audition, and I had come, I had a top hat. That's like how green I was. I brought a top hat to sing at this audition. <laughs> Hello, Dolly, the title number from Hello, Dolly. <laughs> Hello, Dolly, oh my God. Hello. Um, <laughs> Boy, that's terrible. It's terrible, <laughs> absolutely terrible. But I was here, and, um, and they were like, do you want to see a Broadway show? And I said, sure. What, they said, well, what do you want to see? And I said, the Who is Tommy? And they, said, they were like, what? The Who is Tommy? <laughs> Um, How old were you? What kind of a show queen are you? I, not a good one, apparently. <laughs> He's a heterosexual. Uh, I, I can tell <laughs> with the top hat. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but anyway, they took they took me to that, and it was, I mean, really life changing for me. Michael Cerveris was, you know, excellent. Yeah, I remember that. Excellent. I was just like blown away. I've never seen a production of that like scale either. I, you know, I had seen like some things locally growing up, but I was like, oh my god, this is amazing. And John, for you, you, you go back a little ways before. The Who's Tommy? Yeah, you must have been you were a lot younger than me. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't realize that. You was, but not anymore, right. Uh, the first professional show I saw was a bus and truck one night stand tour of Plaza Suite oh. in Jackson, Mississippi, which was 30 miles north of where I grew up, a town called Hazelhurst, mm -hmm. which if you ever saw Beth Henley's play Crimes of the Heart, it takes place in Hazelhurst. Huh. But my mother and I went to see Plaza Suite, and it was Betty Garrett and Larry Parks. Mm. Mm. And that was Good. the first professional show I saw. Good cast, though. Now, John, you went to a Christian college, correct? A I went to a Presbyterian, Presbyterian college. Yes. How did you find your way, you know, here into being lip sync in New York City? <laughs> well, Mississippi was a little more liberal than it is now. Really, yeah. And the Presbyterian College was a lot more liberal than it is now. And they had shows there, and that's when I did Once Upon a Mattress. I was 17 and got cast, like I said, as Sir Studley, and, and got laughs and didn't know I was funny. So I think the audience was laughing at me. And so I thought, well, tomorrow night, which was the last night, I will make sure they laugh with me. And that's when I realized I could get laughs on stage. That's when you became a performer. Mm -hmm. And I started going to drag shows at the local gay bar there. And I enjoyed that. And I started seeing it as ridiculous theater. To me, it, wasn't, it was no longer a drag show. I had been reading about Charles Ludlam. So I thought, well, why couldn't I go to New York and be a drag performer? And I can be in Time Magazine like Charles Ludlam, too. <laughs> so that's what I did. <laughs> and... Uh, and you, Jackie, were you a little girl growing up, wherever you grew up, listening to cast albums? Actually, yeah, I was a, I was a <laughs> gay man by the time I was eight. <laughs> I, I'd, memorized, I, I'd memorized West Side Story and My Fair Lady, and the first production I went to wasn't until I was 11, and that was No No Nanette. Oh. Not the 1925. <laughs> no, the 71. One, yeah. But I was supposed Helen to be Helen Gallagher. And uh, Ruby Keeler. Ruby Keeler. Yeah. I've seen pictures of it, didn't you? See, this is not in your wheel. I'm ch I've checked out long <laughs> yeah, ago. Sorry, but, but I remember yeah. pictures of pe people on big beach balls. You remember that? Yeah. Or, yes, and Bobby yes, Band. Yes. You know, so when the sea. By the sea. He was so charming and sexy and adorable. Yes, yeah. he was. Oh. I saw that. I saw that. And what was the first uh, show that you did, though? Professional. That I did? Yeah. Like, look, not once upon a mattress. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we're talking school. We're talking professional. I'm curious though, what was the first one? When was the, as John said, he, he realized, I'm going to have them laugh with me. Mm -hmm. When was there a moment where you thought, this is good and I'm good at this? 
in fourth grade, which was actually sort of a royalty production. Fourth grade, there was a yeshiva production of Prince and the Pauper, so it was probably either all girls or... <laughs> Uh, and I said, I salute your gracious highness. Be off, you crazy rubbish. Killed. <laughs> <laughs> that switch. <laughs> I salute your great. Be off, you crazy rubbish. <laughs> and, and you're the still doing versions of that. The no. yes. <laughs> My acting style has not progressed. But when something works, you stick with it. And there you are. It you was were fully a formed. <laughs> I want to get back to your production before we go. Please. Why? Isn't that why we're here? Fabulous. And, and one of the wonderful, fullest things is the set which is the artist, Ken Fallon, drawing the scenery live backstage or something. On, mm -hmm. And he's drawing the scenery and then adding stuff. It's so marvelous and yeah. creative. The whole thing is so joyful. Now, and I want to tell you my favorite moment. You come out of the swamp. <coughs> no, there's two favorite moments. You're in one of them. The other one, you come out of the swamp and you sing Shy, which is marvelous. And you are over on the side so ecstatically in love with her. You, he's pulling your focus, but you know, in Don't a way. Tell what? Don't tell that. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, <laughs> equity. <laughs> Jason is great in the show. Yes, he is. I've, yes, he I've is. never met Jason until this show, and I'm just in love with yes, him. Yes, he's the he's perfect boyfriend for me. Yes. <laughs> and, this, and this kind of production shows you, you don't have to spend $10 million to put on no. a musical. And Transport no. Group is known for just out of the box, incredible creativity on a shoestring budget. And that's what they've done. And using Ken Fallon to do these, we jack, we all said we'd like a fractured fairy tale kind of vision. And yeah. it's a very cartoony type of set. And everybody is incredibly funny. So it really works. It's yeah. also really a wonderful. great and ensemble you, in the show. I have to say the ensemble is fantastic in the show. And they're so hardworking and they're so happy to be there. Yes. And then you and your evil song and your wonderful costumes. Did you have input into your costume? I did. Yes. I, <laughs> <laughs> it was contractual. <laughs> well, uh, well really I don't know. There's rumbling around town that it might move to uh, to a bigger uh, theater at some point. Well, it should move. It should move. It's yeah. quite wonderful. Then you guys I, I want to hear that rumbling. <laughs> yeah, yeah you... now we only hear the rumbling of the F train. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Because you're down at the Abrams Art, Art Center, Center, which, which is, is accessible. You can accessible. get there. It's, it's part of the Henry Street, but it's it's re renovated a very hip performing spot that's doing really a lot of interesting things. Yeah. It's the centennial of the theater too. It's their hundredth anniversary. Yeah, it's beautiful old. Yeah, it's theater. a really cool, like a, legitimate proscenium, red curtain. Yes, very cool. So very, <laughs> very cool, show-stopping Jackie Hoffman, lip synca in her all her glory, and this compelling newcomer, Jason Sweet. Tooth Williams, excuse my voice. <laughs> That's all, right. all in Once Upon a Mattress. Lose the top hat, you'll go right to the top. <laughs> all right, thank you guys. It. Don't miss Once Upon a Mattress. See you next time on Broadway. Hopefully. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Get the tiniest key and order one mattress. Don't make that two. The king. So I am so delighted to be joined by my substitute co-host, Nancy Giles, my old pal from CBS Sunday Morning. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. So today we are focusing on King Charles III, Mike Bartlett's highly absorbing and outrageous, and could it be prophetic, play about the British royal family. <laughs> <laughs> it takes place in the near future after Queen Elizabeth has passed away. We are joined by members of its cast. Tim Pickett Smith, who plays Prince Charles, who was finally, after seven decades, getting to be king. Not before time. Right. <laughs> Oliver Chris, who plays Prince William. That's right, Prince William. Rather Machiavellian fellow, it turns out to be. Well, I think he's a good guy in difficult circumstances. All right. And <laughs> Richard Goulding, who plays the dissolute and rather tortured I'll go with tort Prince Harry. Yeah. Yeah. And dissolute, dissolute's good. This play is an, was an enormous hit in London. It is loved by the critics here, and yet it's quite disrespectful, I think, to the royals. No, I don't think it is you disrespectful. Think it I think if it was disrespectful, it would have died a long time ago.
I think the thing I like about it is that it takes them seriously and writes them properly from the inside. And uh, I think when they sent me their play, I don't know what you guys felt, I thought, a play about the modern royal family, this is going to be funny for about 10 minutes and then it'll die on its feet. But about 10 minutes in, you get to an amazing scene where Charles does something really surprising and the play takes off as a play in its own right. So, so do you no. think that Charles in this play is akin to the real Charles? Yes, I mean, people say to me, do I think it's possible that what happens in the play could happen? And I say, no, I don't think it is, but it's plausible. Yes. And I think uh, the reason it's plausible that it's based strongly on common perceptions about Charles, whether or not they're strictly accurate, of course, we don't know. This is, this is a fiction. But we know that he is a, a man who wants to be involved in the workings of, of kingship, whereas the Queen has always been objective. We know that he writes letters lobbying his point of view to parliamentarians and people like that. So this is what happens in the play. He becomes king and wants, he wants to be hands-on. And I think what's interesting is that you get to see the king as a politician as opposed to just a figurehead or trying to be one. And that's a, a view of the monarchy that I don't think many people thought of. I certainly didn't. I think mm. of the headbands, the, you know, the royal, the waves and all that stuff, but not really the makings of politicians. Well, Shakespeare thought of it. And that's what's so marvelous are the, the references to Shakespeare, which are subtly in this play. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Well, I think the, it's the quality of the writing that really stands out. I mean, you're trying to pay homage to Shakespeare in this sort of investigation and adventure into the royal family is a dangerous task for any writer. I mean, it's the risk that you could slide into doggerel and pastiche. Well, it's like the second gimmick of the, of the, you get, as Tim said, you get the center play and it's like, oh, about the royal family, nice try. And then you think, oh, you're trying to write like Shakespeare. Yeah, nice yeah. try again. And it's sort of two things that could fall on, fall on their face, you know, or implode together, but actually. But unfortunately, the sheer quality of yeah. Mike Bartlett's writing is what has made this almost insane idea inflate into yes. this fantastic, incredible production. Yeah. He's taken a huge risk and he's completely nailed it. I think he was way, way ahead of us all. We knew in rehearsal that there was some fun to be had in the play, you know, there's some comic lines, but I don't think any of us realised how funny it really is. I mean, when Richard, <laughs> Richard comes on, Camilla just says, ah, oh, Harry, and the audience laughs. The humour was a complete surprise, as you say, and then, then actually you've got to go, oh, actually, if they're going to enjoy this on that level, they've, there's a serious, two or three serious stories, storylines through. Right. The, now, I, I, manage, I mentioned that it was disrespectful, which you, you shot down immediately, but the, the one thing that I thought was very interesting, when you make your entrance, this topic, which is totally n not dealt with in this country ever, of uh, Harry's paternity, is immediately brought up in the play. And then later going on to Kate Middleton making her rather scurrilous. It's one of the interesting parts of this play, is one of the, and the excellent qualities that Mike's written into it, is that all of the characters are pursuing their own agenda. Mm -hmm. But their own agendas are what they believe to be the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. So there's no, even though Kate has this huge speech about how she plans to connect with be becoming the queen when she finally does, and her, her history and her family being from such a different background to all of ours. A lot of people see that as very Machiavellian or quite Lady Macbeth-like, but really she's talking about the changing times, and she believes that a new era demands a new monarchy, a new role for the royal family, and I she plans to... The, 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 the most Sorry. profound point that Mike makes, yeah. I think the queen, who we know to be religious, believes that she is God's anointed on earth. Mm. I think if you push Charles, he would say under torture, yes, I believe that too, but I suspect in his skin he's only 75% there. But when you think of Kate and William and the way the monarchy will become, I can't for a minute believe that they will believe that they are God's anointed. Oh, no. So there's, there's a fantastic, yeah. you know, something has got to happen to the monarchy when Queen Elizabeth dies. And what will it be? That's one of the reasons why the play was so potent in, yeah. in England. You well, know? I would think also that Diana's influence over her sons was a big shaking up the monarchy kind mm -hmm. of role. Wouldn't you guys agree? Absolutely. Well, uh, yes. I mean, she dropped a hand grenade in the royal, into the royal family, and you know, right. and it was it was a hand grenade that was multiplied because she was just so globally iconic. You know, you can't the royals couldn't sort of hush her up or right. spirit her away because she became the embodiment of of the royal family, and yet she was this 
from their point of view, I would imagine, extraordinarily divisive and destructive. But, you know, there's force. another thing. Like she, mm. she, it, they were her sons. You yeah, know? and that's and the play about the royal family. It's Shakespeare, but it's actually about a family. Mm -hmm. you know? And that that's the, what makes it a great play. I think that it's it's a like Shakespeare's best plays. It's a domestic drama. A back with global sort yes. of universal. Like King Lear, you know, it's the kingdom yeah. and it's the family. It's mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Now back to Diana's hand grenade. Uh, it's interesting though because <laughs> is, that, I, is that a thing? <laughs> <laughs> is that Diana's <laughs> now? <laughs> it is now. <laughs> I have the idea that somewhere well, Diana had a, hand grenade. <laughs> a hashtag. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Diana's hand grenade <laughs> hashtag. Yes. <laughs> one one thinks of what you know this this little almost teenager who married Prince Charles and then how she was transformed to some extent by his problems and his, his love for Carmilla. But your Charles is really very sympathetic. And I mean, the, that, the Diana story cast him as a not very sympathetic man, but you're casting him as quite a sympathetic man. No, I think the play does. The play yes. shows him as a man of principle being overtaken by time and events moving, mm -hmm. moving faster. And funny enough, I, I don't know whether you guys feel this, the, the only area of the play that really upsets me when we play it is the area about Diana. Mm. I don't know why, um, but I just go, oh gosh, we're walking on eggshells here, you know. Really? It's the day when Diana died and uh, the week following that in London was the most Same. amazing yeah, week. And we, I mean, it, we experienced mass hysteria, didn't we? I mean, people were, the, the flowers were 10 yards deep right. outside Buckingham Palace yeah. gates. People were walking down the mall crying. I mean, it was extraordinary. Yeah. And, you know, we are dealing with people who live their lives in public. So I think that gives us every right to do what we do. But that, that one area of it, I just go, oh, God. Well, the fact that Diana's there at all in the play. Yeah. Well, uh, well, I would say yes, it's probably. Quite... It's probably it is. I mean, I one w very uh, in the first scene, I walk up stage with my hands behind my back, which is a, a sort of Prince Philip gesture. But the thing I always remember, where every time I do it, is Harry walking behind mm. uh, the coffin. Oh, oh the cat yes. on that morning, and you know, just go that little boy mm -hmm. and what's happened to them. I suppose that's what it is. It's that area, isn't it? You know, actually, I think they they're, they're pretty remarkable, aren't they? You know, I was wondering for all of you whether it was more difficult or how, what your approach was to playing live characters that are in the press, that were in the press, where you see their pictures and you guys, you know, you're all still alive, the actual people. Is, <laughs> has that been a kind of like wiggy? A, a, there's a version of it where we try, all of us try and do an impression of these people. And mm -hmm. I think that, that might be possible in a different play. This is written in verse, so it sort of heightens it onto a different level of imagination. And I think that... We, we have to do the play. Same Rupert later. was always very clear that, that if we impersonated, <laughs> literally, the, the, the play would be dead <laughs> of on course. its feet. So you're not trying I mean, to do Charles? Well, no, but we, uh, I mean, I use certain gestures, but that's, that, that evolved through rehearsal because you, you thought, well, okay, we won't impersonate. And then you thought, well, I am playing this live character that everybody yeah. knows. And I had a friend who was an impersonator who I was working with when they sent me the play, and I asked him, what he would do if he was doing Charles. And he said, well, he, he always does this thing with his cuffs, and he also does this thing with his signet ring. And then there's this way, you know, he talks out the side of his mouth, you know, like a bit like that. And there's another thing he does, where he, his hands just hover outside his jacket pockets. And it's an, a, an action of such ins uncertainty, yes. it seems oh, to me, to capture God. something that had been written. But in that sense, it's a sort of outside-in exercise. In yes. I, I looked at a few photographs of Harry uh, uh, in the newspaper and some in the way he stands and just sort of used that occasionally in, in rehearsing a scene. Sure. Right. And, and you get and you do find a kind of point of view from a, a physical oh yeah um, yeah gesture think, or whatever. Oliver yeah. have sure. you met the, any royals? Yeah well when William found out that I was going to play him he invited me to Highgrove for, <laughs> oh, yeah. for a game of polo and a yes. kebab and we, <laughs> <laughs> and we sat around and uh, we just sort of chewed the fat as it were and he just told me look just make sure when you play me have more hair um, be as awesome as you possibly can it was it was great we had a great day and then we sort of had like a little pajama party sleepover that night wonderful and I, yeah, and I got helicoptered home the next morning <laughs> okay then so we only have a minute left but I, I do want to ask you know questioning this concept of the royals at all I mean you say you know they're in the public eye and they have to do this but here they are these people getting all this free stuff all this money <laughs> uh, you know this this incredible pos position in life and there's a way that, that as an American, I look at the royals and go, well, I see the tradition, but what's up with that? Can you, I mean, did you, did, did you ever have that jaundiced view as Brits, or you're just so respectful? It's oh, no, I don't know. Well, I, don't know. The play, I, mean, I think part, part England would be a better place if it was a republic. Yes. But I happen to be a monarchist. <laughs> I like you the are. monarchy. Yes. Well, you Why? know. 
They look terribly good. The costumes are cracking. You know? <laughs> the costumes are pretty great. <laughs> I know. I do so dig that. So it's the tourist thing. It's a deep, deep, ingrained cultural yeah. thing. Mm -hmm. We every country need a, needs a figurehead. You have your your president. We have our royal family. We've spent since the Civil War. We've spent about five hundred years lopping the limbs off our royal family and sculpting them into exactly what we need them for. Mm -hmm. And on the surface, they're expensive. But if you think how how many tourist I hesitate to say tourist dollars that, that they oh, generate for us. So it's yeah. probably and, yeah. and I think but that, but not only that, but they provide us with a figurehead and they provide us with a check and balance above the, what you can only really describe as the stultifying mediocrity of our politicians. Unlike our fabulous politicians. Oh, please. <laughs> if you were to get rid of the royal family, who would you replace them with? What? Tony Blair? Bolly's right. There's something in our blood. Chesterton wrote a poem called The Secret People, you know, and we, we had a, a commonwealth in the 17th century and we didn't like it, so yeah. we just quietly went back to what we liked. I think part of the reason why the play is, is a success is because we don't just blindly accept it in, 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 in um, England, Britain either. We, we, there's, a, there's, a, there's a live debate about it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Massive. You know, we've got a left-wing, strong left-wing press than, as, as much as a right-wing press, and, mm. and it's live in the papers, that debate about is it a good thing or not, and that's what the play addresses, and therefore it's um, you know, a smash hit. A smash hit, <laughs> yes. A smash hit, King Charles III, now at the Music Box Theatre. We want to thank you all so much for coming. Thanks for having, thanks for having us. Our thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Bowe Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, the Noel Coward Foundation, Carrie J. Freeze, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, and the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. We welcome your questions or comments for Theatre Talk. Thank you.